I'm joined by Harry Littman from the Talking Feds YouTube channel. You know, Harry, here on the Midas Touch Network, we did a video yesterday covering the Supreme Court's decision. It was an eight to one decision in a case, United States versus Rahimi, uh, involving a, f a federal statute that would prevent someone who was uh, subject to a domestic violence restraining order from having firearms and charging that individual. And on an eight to one basis, in theory, that's simply a lie. Eight Supreme Court justices can agree on something. They upheld that statute and they said that it's within the Constitution. The Second Amendment allows for there to be restrictions on gun access to uh, domestic abusers, to domestic violence attackers and assailants, if it meets certain kind of requirements. Um, the Fifth Circuit, based on a prior ruling by the Supreme Court in 2022, um, had previously said, no, the domestic abusers should have a full right to is the Bruin case. Based on the Bruin case, they should have full access to guns, even if they're subject to a domestic violence restraining order. But yes, let's talk about the, the, the decision. But I think what was interesting is all of the concurring opinions where you see all of these justices, uh, especially the right-wing justices and Justice Kavanaugh and the issue of scrutiny, posturing and positioning for things that are so unheard of that it was, it was baffling to read. And so, yes, the headline is only Clarence Thomas said domestic abusers should be entitled to having access to guns and they and that they should guns for everybody is the Clarence Thomas position. So in theory, you're like, wow, the Supreme Court, eight of them agreed, eight justices, some of the liberal ones and conservative or MAGA ones agree. But it's deeper than that, right, Harry? Yeah, so I really think so. This I think is a super interesting case that's going to resonate like in many different areas. Yeah. So first, right, uh, not to uh, permit a state to say someone is under restraining order and is a is a shown danger to a person can't have a gun is would be a stunning outcome right but they were in a corner that they had painted themselves in in this case 2 years ago in Bruin where they tried to say if there wasn't the equivalent regulation way back when then it doesn't uh, the the Second Amendment uh, uh, trumps any any new regulation, and that's what Thomas, being consistent, said. You know, there we didn't have domestic violence restraining orders in the 1820s, and you know, of of course, uh, you know, women in in many ways weren't even full citizens. So um, for that to have controlled would have been lunacy, and the members of the Supreme Court realized it. But they had to give a rationale to try to be consistent with this test that they from two years ago, and not only in guns, but you. I know your um, listeners probably know that in across a range of the most controversial areas, the court touches abortion and same-sex marriage, and there there is these raging debates about what they've called history and tradition. And so, if it's a so-called unenumerated right they look for what have we done in in history before and this was a really um rough uh position for them as i said because you know it depends very much how you define the what's been done before so here's what chief justice roberts says but this is going to be thrown back all over the federal courts over the next few years if the if okay maybe there's not a domestic violence restraining order in the 1820s or whatever but there are things that are relevantly similar like ways you used to restrain violent people from from carrying out their violent deeds man relevantly similar that lets a lot into the that's a big rabbit in the hat because what does it mean relevantly is a same sex marriage relevantly similar to a heterosexual marriage is a abortion regulation relevantly similar to regulation of family planning etc so that that really opens the field and yes you saw all the justices staking out different positions that i think they're going to adhere to going forward kavanaugh really was a stunner he says 
you know, people who, who listen to this podcast, maybe know the podcast Strict Scrutiny. That's for the level of scrutiny that the Supreme Court applies in certain important constitutional questions. Kavanaugh says, eh, let's just do away with levels of scrutiny altogether. That's a revolution uh, in a really a counter revolution in, in law. Um, Gore, and each of them was, was sort of staking out fine grained distinctions that in the coming terms, they're going to have to kind of wrestle with and figure out and is at least as things stand, we have this relevantly similar idea, but it's kind of a mess. We don't know where the court's going to wind up. What we know is, come on, you have to be able to restrain somebody in this situation. And they did, but they've staked out arguments that are going to play out very differently in future cases, depending on these little nuances. Well, then you had last week's decision that they reached, and I want to get your take on the timing yeah. of, you know, because you had the Garland versus Cargill decision last week um, saying that bump stocks were not machine guns pursuant to the statute that restricted machine gun use by civilians. But when I read that 1986 statute, it seemed pretty clear to me that a bump stock, at least at least the portion of the statute that talked about the various parts and component parts, not just the machine gun itself that function like a machine gun, um, that at least a bump stock could be subject to the ban. Now, the bump stock decision was really not part of the court's Second Amendment jurisprudence. I think it was a way that they were uh, attacking all agencies that try to get involved in anything unless Congress specifically uses magic words as a way to take power away from the federal government. And that's why they said the ATF uh, didn't have the power to have these expanded regulations because Congress in 1986 couldn't foresee in future tell the creation of bump stocks in 2002 yeah. or 2003. So it was a different body of law but it's notable that they did the bump stock case first, which pissed off most of the country. I would say 70% 70, 70 or so yeah. of the country. Then they did this decision afterwards, which, I mean, just the very idea of giving guns to people subject to domestic yeah. Can you imagine if it had gone the other way, right? Yeah. I think you've really put your finger on the latent issue there, and a lot of people have missed it. I'll leave it to, uh, to Ben to, to really zero in because it's this issue of deference that I thought was big there. They are really have a, have a general project of going after the administrative state and nothing a conservative loves more than slapping down the ATF. So to the extent it was a close case, first of all, the reasoning they applied, you're right, it's not constitutional. It, it was administrative, but still it's this kind of stiff, very sort of rigid, mechanistic, you know, lacking in common sense kind of of uh, reasoning that they couldn't do in the Rahimi case. But second, you know, in the previous uh, terms, this would have been decided by giving deference to the ATF. And we're going to see in among their, you know, remaining 15 or whatever cases, there's one that could even do away with the general principle of deference to administrative agencies. But we know whether that kind of um, administers the death blow or not, they have in their sights a real, real cutting back on uh, deference to agencies, which, by the way, when it came of age in the 80s, um, conservatives liked that principle uh, in part because they felt they had better control of the White House. Um, but now with the, with the sort of shoe on the other foot, they have them in the, the agencies in the crosshairs. And that's a central plank of, of Trump's um, you know, big project going forward is the deep state and keeping, uh, getting the power away from them. But that's, that's going to be of a piece with what they do in the next 10 days with administrative agencies in general. Well, everybody, make sure you subscribe to the Harry Littman YouTube channel. It's called Talking Feds YouTube channel, same name as Harry's podcast. Subscribe right now. 
Let's help him get to 250,000 subscribers. They're partnered with the Midas Touch Network, and we always want our crew to keep on growing. So subscribe there right now. Harry, thanks as always. Thank you, Ben. Good to be with you as always. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.